problem with that is I kept finding these really interesting stories and they would never let me put them in. And the one I'm going to focus on now is Benedict Arnold because I always was trying to get Benedict Arnold into textbooks. And they were always taking him out and they were always saying, well, just say that he's a traitor. That's all you need to know. And that's really all anybody does know. There's hundreds of schools now. And that's fine, but it's such a wasted opportunity, again, to do this thing that we really need to do, which is convince students to be interested in history and engage with it. And if you have this outrageous action-adventure story and you just waste it, it's a real shame. And I was always pestering the editors about it. Here's a classic picture of Arnold. It had his best. He's the guy that, this is actually from the Battle of Saratoga, an image of what, he, what it might have looked like there, charging into battle. Some people said like a crazy person. People would accuse him of getting drunk before battles, but that was just classic loose cannon Benedict Arnold. Uh, and the editor told me something actually really insightful when I said, why can't we put any of this stuff in? And he said, this is the exact quote, he said, Benedict Arnold makes people nervous. <laughs> Which seems like as a storyteller, that's a good thing. If you're going to write a novel, you want a character, you have a character that's going to create chaos and make people nervous. That's good, right? But it's very bad in textbooks where they want, especially for younger students, they want no moral ambiguity at all which is a little bit crazy if you're trying to tell American history, which is more or less based on founders who are filled with these moral contradictions. But Arnold makes people particularly nervous, I think because he's, he's a villain, but he was also a hero. And he did so much to help win the revolution. How do we explain that? And when I tell that to students, they're usually offended, I think appropriately so, to say, but we can handle that. We understand that there's uh, contradictions within people, and certainly that's true in superheroes and villains that you see in those kind of movies. But for some reason, he never made it in. And that was just one example of hundreds of stories I could never get in textbooks. So I started my own series of books, and I just basically put in all the things they would never let me put in textbooks. I started with King George, what was his problem? And just put in, I just wanted it to be kind of funny, and it's an untextbook. It's got a light, irreverent tone, there are comics in it. And we did three of those, and then that brought me to this guy, Benedict Arnold. There are really no good pictures of him. He doesn't look too cool in that picture, I have to admit. <laughs> Just one of those Eoldi engravings. But I was so happy. We were casting about for ideas to write a kind of a narrative nonfiction, a longer, more ambitious book for young adults. And my editor knew of my long-time obsession. She said, didn't you want to write about Benedict Arnold? And that was the start of a really successful part of my career. And that was when I had just gotten married recently. My wife Rachel is here tonight. Not just because we did a, thank you, we did a proper honeymoon, but then this was about a year later, and she, of course, knew of my law. I used to go on, on trips um, to see the sites, so she knew all about my obsession. But I said, let's take all our vacation this year and go on a Benedict Arnold road trip. <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> and she said yes. And so that was a great launching into this story and the research of this story. Here I am at Benedict Arnold's birthplace. Anyone, can anyone name this town? You can't tell from this picture, but yeah, he's from, he's from Norwich, Connecticut. And if you go there, you think there's a Benedict Arnold Middle School? <laughs> they hate him to this day. He makes them nervous. He makes them nervous. And one guy there was, so who was on a historical council um, and was trying to get people interested in the city. He said, how come Salem can make money on witches and we can't make money on Benedict Arnold? Mm -hmm. I thought, that, that's exactly right. You should, you should embrace. This is your guy. You have to embrace him. But if you go there, there's, there's nothing except this little kind of pathetic plaque that was put up privately by a local jeweler uh, marking the place where he was born. And they tell crazy stories about him. Uh, as a kid, he was just always this wild, adventurous kid. And it was kind of fun-loving when he was younger. He would jump on the water wheel in town just to, just to make adults scared because it got attention. You know, it got him. He had to be the center of attention no matter what, whether it meant breaking the rules or not. And as he got older, his life really took some dark turns. His sisters died in an epidemic of yellow fever. His father became an alcoholic and lost the family business. So Benedict had been planning to go to Yale. Hopefully that was the big thing to do if you're from Connecticut, but they didn't have money for that. He had to become an apprentice instead and was very bitter about the fall of his family and, and very resentful 
toward the way he was, their family was viewed in Norwich. And I think that very much played into the whole story. But the only other place you'll see the Arnold name in Norwich today is on these, this very, very old, I love these old New England gravestones. There's just something dramatic about them. But this is his mother's. This is Hannah Arnold, his mother. And if you go into this old graveyard, you'll see the spots that used to be his father's. His father was also named Benedict. And when our famous Benedict became a traitor, the people in town were so angry they they wanted to destroy the name, and they picked up the gravestone that was there and smashed it mm. in the ground. And the name Benedict Arnold just hasn't been seen since in this gravestone. It's a very powerful thing to go and sit by this grave from the 1750s. Now, he moved to New Haven after that, after he got done with his apprenticeship and started a apothecary shop, kind of like a drugstore. He had a little bit of everything. He imported stuff from, from London. And was a very, very successful businessman. He's a really smart guy, very ambitious, uh, but always very restless too. And he, was, he joined the militia, and when the revolution started, he was literally the first guy in New Haven to say, all right, here we go. They heard about Lexington and Concord. Now we're marching to Boston. We're going to go fight. And there's a classic scene early in his story where they marched to the powder house to get the guns and gunpowder. And the, the town elders said, well, hold on. We're not even sure what happened yet. And he said, you guys, I'm taking the stuff with or without your permission. We're going to kick down the door and take the gunpowder and march to Boston. And he did. And of course, you could see that sort of made him heroic to some people, but he, he always rubbed people in power the wrong way. And that definitely came back to haunt him. But they did get the stuff. They marched to Boston. He met George Washington really early in the war and got this mission of going to Fort Ticonderoga to try and capture that fort and bring the cannons that were there back to Boston. And this, the credit for that goes entirely to this guy, Ethan Allen. This is a picture that was always in textbooks, too. Ethan Allen pounding at the door at Fort Ticonderoga, waking the British up. And apparently, according to contemporary accounts, he said something like, come out of there, you damn rat. But you're not allowed to say that in textbooks. Another great <laughs> lost opportunity. But, and also, the other thing that happened was the guy, when he came out, he had no pants on. But you're not allowed to show that either in textbooks. Kids would love that detail. <laughs> but anyway, they captured the fort, Arnold and, and Ethan Allen together. But where Arnold really started to make his name was, he came back to, to, to Boston and pitched this idea to General Washington, the new, newly appointed general, said, we need to attack Canada. We need to go on the offensive. He was always thinking, we're not just going to wait here for them to attack us. Uh, we need to go up and take Canada, which essentially meant taking two cities, Montreal and Quebec. And they were going to, Washington wanted to send a larger army to Montreal, but Arnold said, I can take Quebec. If you give me a thousand men, I, I can use old Indian paths through Maine. He didn't actually know where these paths went. <laughs> but he's, he's a good talker. He said, I know how to get there, don't worry. You give me the guys and some money, and we'll march through New England, and we'll hit Quebec from behind, essentially. They won't even know we're coming. And this is, a great, this is a great map, just because it shows the geography of it. The main attack, it's really quite easy to come up, up water, waterways, Lake Champlain up across the St. Lawrence River to Montreal, which is here, and Quebec is here, much more remote. So Arnold's plan was to go through Massachusetts and then up through this unmapped part of Maine. And this is really where he made, made his name. And this is a story that should be and would be one of the most famous stories in American history if he hadn't gone and ruined it later himself by becoming a traitor, because this, there's almost nothing like this in American history. There's some good images of these guys marching through the woods. And this is late fall. Can you imagine what that was like? Carrying everything on their backs. A lot of these guys were 16, 17 years old. <coughs> they quickly uh, ran out of food. Things either got spoiled or lost in rapids as they're trying to paddle up these rivers in Maine. Um, and you think Maine would be really proud of this, but again, on a road trip, this was the nicest sign I saw. <laughs> and it's one of these things, teachers want you to teach visual literacy. You look at a picture and you sort of interpret it. And look at the way, this is perfect for that. The sign's falling off. You can see there's a screw missing there. It's all rusted. They don't really like, they're not proud of this march through Maine, though they should be. But this is one of the best parts of the trip, I think. It's really amazing. And I had to do some sketches along the way. 
And this was great, when we met these guys, the Arnold Expedition Historical Society. When you think you're into something a little weird and then you meet someone who also is into it, you know that feeling? <laughs> that's, what, that's what it was like, these guys are really into Benedict Arnold. But they're really specifically into this one part of the story, trying to figure out the root of his march. They do a lot of archaeology and find artifacts from these soldiers who marched through Maine. They, they created trails that you could march on here, it's Rachel and uh, the Arnold Expedition Portage Trail. They've recreated boats, these bateaux they call them, that these guys used. These boats weighed 400 pounds each. And they were a completely wrong type of boat. This was like the first example of a military contractor ripping off the taxpayers. Um, and they were just built really quickly and sloppily. And when the Arnold's men saw them, they said, how are we going to take these over the mountains of Maine? But they had to, they had no choice. And so when they got to rapids, which are everywhere in Maine, they had to take all the stuff out, all the food, all the provisions, and put four men to a boat, put them on their shoulders. And when you read their accounts, there are a lot of journals, thankfully to a researcher, they talk about the skin just wearing off their shoulders and the bones being visible. And you could see exactly how that would happen when you see these boats and imagine walking over a muddy mountain carrying this boat on your shoulder. It's a lot easier to paddle these days. Looks very easy now, right? <laughs> there are dams on, on most of these. This is the Kennebec River in Maine. And it's just beautiful, but it's also, if you can imagine a little bit, beyond the physical beauty of it, which they probably didn't appreciate as much, what it would be like in October, November, to be marching over these mountains with hundreds of pounds each of provision. What's really interesting is when you cross the the border into Canada, they like Benedict Arnold. <laughs> he doesn't make them nervous, apparently. This is the greatest thing. The Aubert Arnold, the Benedict Arnold Inn and Steakhouse. <laughs> and you can see again from the picture, is this like the classiest place in Quebec now? <laughs> uh, but Rachel spoke some wonderful French and got us a room at this place. That was, that was one of the highlights. This is the only place in the world with a Benedict Arnold garbage can. <laughs> That's the greatest thing. Out by the dirty little pool that you always have in a motel. Greatest thing. Here I am thinking, should I just put this in our car right now? Because where are you going to see something like that? And then you get to Quebec, and it didn't have all these buildings, but it does look, did, it does look like something out of a fairy tale. It was literally the strongest fortress in North America. The city on a, on a cliff with a mile-wide river, which was already beginning to ice over in front of it. It's the worst, the last place you'd ever want to attack. And these guys showed up with five rounds of ammunition each, literally in rags, out of food. They said they looked like scarecrows. They felt a little ridiculous showing up and demanding the city to surrender. And when they didn't, everyone expected them to go back. But Arnold said, no, we've come this far, we're going to attack. And they did. <coughs> in a snowstorm on the last day of 1775, and this was really what made Arnold kind of a star in the, in the world of the American Revolution. They lost. It was hopeless. They lost. He was shot in his leg and carried back from the battlefield. But it sort of established him as this really up and coming. It made him a general and, and it really caught George Washington's attention. It's interesting to go and, and you could walk on the walls today. This is a plaque where Arnold was shot. And the story just continues along this one corridor. This is a good place to tell this story because I know you know, all, you know the geography. The next year, the British said, all right, you attacked us. This year, we're going to attack you. Using the same routes, we're going to come down Lake Champlain. And they, the British built a, a special fleet of ships to come down Lake Champlain. This is the British Navy now, so you know they're serious. And they needed, the Americans needed someone to try and stop them on this lake where they could. The plan all along was to go down the lake to get to Albany and then use the Hudson River to slice the colonies in two going all the way down to New York City. It's a good plan. But first they had to control the lake. And Arnold volunteered to be in charge of this fleet on Lake Champlain. And everyone said, yes, you, you, yes, you do that. And he really felt, he started to see that no one expected him to be able to do it around him. Higher ranking generals didn't want anything to do with this operation. but. He built an entire fleet, very small ships, and very quickly on the lake, and realizing he couldn't actually win an open water battle with the British Navy. He had all volunteers. Some were somewhat trained as sailors, 
And he had been a, a commercial captain in his civilian life, but didn't know anything about the Navy necessarily. And has anyone been to this part of the lake with Alcor Island? He decided he would hide his, his only chance was to use a bit of guile. He would hide his little navy behind Belcourt Island, let the British sail past them, getting cocky, and then he would kind of come out and try to attack them one by one. And that was the plan, and it sort of worked. It got them off to a, a pretty decent start, but it was inevitable that they were going to be blown away once the ships really started facing each other and firing away at each other. And when I picture naval battles, I picture ships like this. This is a picture from the Battle of Dalcor Island, but if you go to the Smithsonian, has anyone seen this in the American History Museum at the Smithsonian? This was the kind of boat that Benedict Arnold built. Would you like to be in a battle with the British Navy in that? <laughs> Can you imagine that? And these guys were charging around this tiny deck trying to fire cannons at the British ships. And so inevitably, in a couple of days, all of the American ships sank. And this one was found. The lake is so cold, it's really well preserved. It was found in the 1930s and brought back up. And you can see the holes, it's riddled with holes from British cannon. And uh, it's great to just get down there and kayak on the lake and see where this, again, it's so beautiful, but you can almost begin to picture where these things happen when you can see it. But if you look for people talking about a great, what a great hero Benedict Arnold was at Lake Champlain, you don't really find it there either. There's this tiny plaque commemorating the valor of American forces led by Benedict Arnold at the Battle of Alcor, October 11, 1776. There's a tiny little flag next to it. And again, this would be one of the hugest stories. People talk about Washington crossing the Delaware. That's nothing compared to these, this march to Quebec and the Battle of Alcor Island that would be the biggest stories in American history, I'm sure. But moving on, that led again to this same plan the next year. Arnold pushed the British back. He gave them such a beating, even though he lost all his ships that the British said, that's it, we're going to go back to Canada, we'll regroup, we'll try again next year. So in a way, it really kept the revolution alive, because that was the same summer that George Washington was being routed, lost New York City, retreating through New Jersey, losing every battle. So this really kept the revolution alive. And the next year, they came back again, and that's what led to this showdown right here at Saratoga. They got through the lake this time oh, and, and to the overland part of the trip where they were trying to get from the southern part of the lake to Albany. And that led to this showdown right here. And it's funny when Jamie and I were talking before, you said you used to work at the, as a ranger at yeah. the park or mm -hmm. interpreter. And everybody there that I've met has the same experience that you were telling me, which is that people have totally different opinions about Benedict Arnold. He was definitely a key figure there. He was a general. He was second in command to this guy, Horatio Gates. And they completely grew to despise one another. They had very different strategies about how they should win. Gates wanted to kind of wait. They had built these forts. Let's just wait for the British to come. And Arnold said, no, no, that's not how you fight these guys. You can't let them dictate the action. We've got to go out in the woods and create chaos and fight our way in the woods, and they just went back and forth. And of course, there was also a lot of, especially on Gates' side, concern that Arnold was going to take credit for this showdown battle. Yeah. And to this day, people disagree about how much credit Arnold deserves. I think quite a lot, because he really defied Gates. Gates ended up confining him to his tent at one point. Even that didn't work. Arnold ran out anyway, charged on his horse, and, and did stuff like this. And, and eventually, in two battles, broke the British lines by fighting his way, going out and attacking. And the British general, John Burgoyne, later said, I thought we had it won. We were going to march, we were going to... He knew Gates, he knew Gates' style. He said, we were going to bring our cannons right up, we were going to fight our way, and it would have worked. But they decided to take the battle to us instead, and that kind of ruined our plan. Mm. Uh, but Arnold was shot in the second battle of Saratoga in the same leg, again. Not only that, but his, and his horse fell on the leg after it had been shattered. And it, the bones were sticking out. It was, it was a terrible wound. He was taken by cart to Albany, which must have been excruciating, lying in this cart, this broken leg. And the doctors immediately said, we have to amputate. But he said, absolutely not. I don't want to be an amputee. Just fix it some way. And they, they had no way to fix that kind of wound. It was compound fracture with all kinds of nerve damage. And uh, they just put it in a box, basically, because he told them, 
if, if I wake up without this leg, I'm going to shoot somebody. He had a gun by his bed. That's the kind of guy Benedict Garland was. It's very tough to get along with. So they said, all right, all right. They put it in what they called this fracture box. It was very primitive. Just a cast, basically, made of wood. And his leg was, when it finally healed, in quotes, healed, it was two inches shorter than it had been before, and he was in terrible pain the rest of his life. I really think that's a little bit of an underrated factor in the way he behaved in subsequent years. But what I know must have driven him crazy is that he had to lay in this hospital in Albany while Horatio Gates, his enemy and rival, took all the credit for the British surrender at Saratoga. This is a famous picture from the surrender showing General John Burgoyne giving his sword to Horatio Gates and Gates being very gracious and handing it back and just being the great gentleman. And, and everyone toasted him. Congress made him a special medal for General mm -hmm. Gates. And Arnold must have been sitting in Albany just stewing over that. And if you go to this area today, even Burgoyne gets a little in. Maybe not the nicest <laughs> place you've ever seen. And Gates gets a, a road. Two is just an avenue extension. Uh, and and um, to this day, we're still nervous about what to do about Benedict Arnold. Has anyone seen the Benedict Arnold monument there? Mm -hmm. It's the weirdest one in the country. And when I show this to students, they, they all crack up. But if you go there, it almost looks like he's in jail. But it doesn't look like much of a, a monument at all, does it? Because many years later, they had to build this park. And they thought, well, do we make a statue to this guy who was a hero here, but then later became a traitor? It's actually a really big question about American history. And I, the middle school here last year invited me to a debate. They said, we're going to debate whether or not there should have been a Benedict Arnold statue, a real Benedict Arnold statue at Saratoga. And it's really a big question about that fundamental thing about American history that we were talking about at the beginning. Do you acknowledge these contradictions, or do you just want it all to be nice and neat? And it was a really good debate. But they did something in between. They said, well, he was shot in the leg at Quebec, and then again, here at Saratoga. We like that part of him. That's cool. So we're just going to make a monument of just his leg. <laughs> and if you go there, that's what you see. And there's not even, his name isn't even on it. And it's very strange, isn't it? It's really weird. Gives you an idea of what um, people still think of him and how, how nervous he still makes everybody. So after that, he moved to Philadelphia. This, this is, I think, George, the worst decision George Washington made in his whole life, is that he knew Arnold was unable to ride a horse, so he couldn't go back into battle, but he wanted to give him something prestigious, because he liked Arnold, and he knew Arnold had a fragile ego. So he said, I'll put you as the military governor of Philadelphia. They had just retaken Philadelphia from the British. It was the worst job. It was essentially a political job, and he immediately began annoying everybody. He loved li living a high life, too. So he spent a lot of money at a time when the city was really trying to be revolutionary and overthrow this old way of life. He still liked to wear wigs and fancy clothes and drive around in wagons, which, which was very out of fashion. And so he made enemies with everybody, but he didn't care. He married this young woman named Peggy Shippen and bought this beautiful house that he could really could not afford, but that's not a trait about Arnold. He was always a big spender, whether he had the money or not. And this is where the story be becomes a really interesting kind of love triangle. Because when the British had occupied Philadelphia, Peggy had known and quite possibly been romantically involved with this young British officer named John Andre, who was a high-ranking officer with the British intelligence. And at some point after their marriage, Arnold and Peggy Shippen, Peggy Arnold now, decided, and to this day, and this is a really interesting question, no one knows what role she played in this. I'm convinced it was a very large role. They decided together that they would approach the British. Arnold was at this point so bitter toward the way he'd been treated at Saratoga and then Philadelphia, passed over for promotions, accused of all kinds of things. Um, he decided to approach the British and see what they would give for him. And he convinced himself, in classic Arnold fashion, that he wasn't doing it to be a traitor, he was doing it to stop the revolution and bring us all together again. Because we had proven our point now, the British were ready to concede all kinds of political freedom to the colonies at that point. So let's just get together, let's not um, break apart this 
this close relationship that we've had. That was in his mind, this kind of delusional reason for doing it. But he also wanted a lot of money, which tells you something. And he and Arnold, Arnold and, and John Andre passed back and forth these encrypted notes. And the British were very interested in Arnold because it would be a huge coup to get him to change sides. No one that, at that rank had ever changed sides in the war. But to Arnold's chagrin, they didn't, they weren't going to give, he wanted 20,000 pounds. They're not going to give him that kind of money, Mil millions of dollars in today's money. They said, we're not going to give you that kind of money unless you give us something concrete. I mean, you're good, don't get me wrong, but we want something real, something tangible that will help us win the war. And that's where they came up in these encrypted notes with the idea of West Point, which was a really important fort. You could even see it in, the, in this picture, why it was so important, because of the way the Hudson River curves around the fort there. It made it basically impassable. The British couldn't use the Hudson River north of West Point. They just couldn't get past it. But if they could capture the fort, now that would be something. And so they worked out this plan for Arnold to get himself appointed commander of West Point. Washington did it, but he had no idea why. He, said, I, he later said, I didn't suspect Arnold any more than I suspected myself. He just couldn't understand why he would want this, basically a backwater job. For an offensive-minded general, why would you want to guard this post that's fairly easy to defend? Uh, but Arnold insisted this was the job that he had to have, and he got it. And just to raise the stakes even higher, he and John Andre planned to do this takeover, the British takeover of the fort, as Washington was visiting. So can you imagine how different history of this country would be if, they, if the plan had worked and they had captured George Washington? That came within a hair of happening. Where it all started to fall apart, this is an engraving of what we think happened, is that Arnold insisted on one last meeting. He was a very, very thorough guy. He was a loose cannon, but he was also quite brilliant. And he had everything worked out. This exact schedule of when the British should do every little thing to attack the fort. And John Andre came to visit him, came up on a British ship, and they met. And Arnold took him into his house near West Point and gave him papers explaining how to do all these things. And Andre's general had told him, whatever you do, don't take papers. He'll explain the plan to you, remember it. This is classic for, for espionage 101. Do not take incriminating papers. But uh, Andre later said, he made me take them. Arnold was a real, was a force of nature. He forced me to take them. And he put them in his boot next to his stocking. And then tried to go back down to the waterfront to his ship that was waiting to take him back to New York City. And if he had made it on that ship, this plan would have worked. And I love reenactors. This is another thing we did on our trip, go to see reenactors. And obviously this is not a photograph from the American Revolution, but it might have looked something like this, where these militiamen, these Americans, saw this British ship hovering around West Point, and they, start, they fired at it without even any orders. They just fired at it. And this completely changed the course of history, because the ship had to fall back Andre couldn't get on the boat now. It would have been really easy for him to sail back to New York with these plans. And they were going to spring the trap within the next day. So instead he got on a horse and tried to ride from West Point to New York City, which should have been a fairly easy ride. And it's funny to think of it today. Westchester, which is this affluent suburb, was this really dangerous no man's land where it was patrolled by kind of gangs from both sides. They called themselves militias, but they were really kind of gangsters, robbing people, going back and forth. And so Arnold was back safely in West Point, and Andre got on this horse. And this is Tarrytown, New York. They're famous for The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. And this. They got two really good things that happened right here. <laughs> and this is a park in Tarrytown. If you're, again, the guy in the front taking picture kind of ruins the effect, as does the police car. Yeah. <laughs> but he is marching, he's riding through, he's really close to the safe line, the British line, when these guys jumped out. They later claimed because they're patriots, probably to rob him. In fact, they did try to rob him. And that's kind of shown in this recreation. These guys are really proud of this. But what they don't tell you in the recreation, or at least they don't do, is that they could see this guy was some kind of gentleman. And they knew he must have money, but he didn't have any money on him. And so they started stripping him. And they got him completely naked by the side of the road, which they do not do in this family recreation now. Uh, 
But when they finally got down, again, this is a PG version of it, when they finally got down to his stockings and got his stockings off and his boots, they found these papers written by Benedict Arnold. And that, that's when it dawned on them, this guy must be a spy. And so they brought him to an American fort, and he was held in what is now a restaurant, the old 76 house. And it was really obvious that he was a spy. He had done the exact thing he shouldn't have done, which was to take papers on him. And so there was a one-day trial, but it was really just a formality. And I love this as a different kind of primary source, which is that he was convicted. Washington didn't... <coughs> he had to hang him. He, he felt like he had to. That was what the British had hanged Nathan Hale and other American <coughs> spies, and that was, the, that was how it was done. He didn't want to show any weakness. He kind of liked John Andre. Everybody kind of liked him, but he didn't want to show an ounce of weakness. So they told him, you're going to be executed tomorrow. And the last thing he did was draw this picture, which is pretty amazing. First of all, he was a very talented artist, and much better as an artist than as a spy, obviously. But he said, I want, he gave it to his guard, he said, I want everyone to remember me like this. And I can't imagine he felt like that an hour before he was going to be taken out into a field, but that's the last thing he did, which is really amazing. I'm very thankful that the guard saved it. And, and we have it today. But the hanging was really very primitive. They did not build a movie-style gallows or anything. They just slapped together some pieces of wood and made him jump off the back of a wagon. And Arnold, of course, became, this is a march burning Benedict Arnold in effigy, towns all over, especially the towns that he had lived in, Norwich, New Haven, and other towns that he was associated with, had parades and burned Arnold effigies but meanwhile, he had escaped. When he found out that Andre had been captured, he jumped on a boat, and he did get to New York City and joined the British. And can you imagine the reception he got? It's a good example of why, you, not that you want to become a traitor anyway, but the bad part of becoming a traitor is that, of course, the people you betray hate you, but it turns out the other side kind of hates you too. And that's what happened when he arrived in New York, and they all said, but what about John Andre? He was so beloved in the officer corps, and they actually tried to trade. The British generals really would have loved to trade Arnold back in exchange for Andre. And Washington was absolutely up for it. He de definitely wanted to do it. But then the British said, well, if we do that, we're kind of breaking our word, and no one will ever come over to our side again. So they, they kept Arnold, but hated him. And so the rest of his life was really miserable. He moved back and forth between the Caribbean, Canada, London, just trying to get some businesses going, trying to establish something, and he never really could. Peggy stayed with him the whole time, and they had several kids. Can you imagine what that would be like, to be children of Benedict Arnold? And he was eventually died, and he and Peggy are both buried in this tiny church in London. Beneath this church lies buried the bodies of Benedict Arnold, sometime general of the army of George Washington, kind of a subtle way of <laughs> approaching the topic of what he did. But um, in a way, Benedict Arnold is still very much alive and well. If you go to Colonial Williamsburg, anyone been there? Uh, he's there. This is the guy who plays Benedict Arnold. And actors always want to be the villain. So this is the best job in Colonial. Would you rather be the cobbler or Benedict Arnold? Come on. And I was invited to do a talk there, but well, really it was a book signing, except it wasn't a book signing because I was just sitting in this kind of mall, you walk through this kind of cheesy shopping mall to get to the Eoldi part of town, and, and you're just really tired parents with cranky kids, and nobody really wants to buy any books, but then thankfully this guy showed up, Benedict Arnold, he said, well hello sir, my name is Benedict Arnold, and he had the cane, he's got his red coat, so you know which side he's on now, and then he sat down next to me and said, Hey, what's up? I'm Scott. And, uh, and we just shared Benedict Arnold's stories. And this guy, I thought I was obsessed. This guy is really obsessed. But he, he, he goes to the gas station as Benedict Arnold in rural Virginia. So that takes some courage. Uh, but he just loves it. And it was just it was great to swap stories with him. He felt the book was pretty fair, uh, fair-minded. But it was pretty good. And... That's my Benedict Arnold journey. 
Uh, I love telling this story. I love, we were not, we were living in New York City at the time, and we since moved to Saratoga. It was not, not to be closer to Benedict Arnold, <laughs> uh, but that's a nice perk to it. I love going to the battlefield these days. It's so beautiful. But um, I'd love to hear if anyone has any questions or wants to share their own opinions, because I love how this story generates different opinions. Yeah. So when you, when you took the journey to do the whole thing, did you do it all at once, and if so, how long did it take you? Yeah, we didn't do all of it. We took two weeks, and we focused on, of course, this was pre-kids. You can't do this with kids in the back seat, yeah. saying, are we there yet? Mm -hmm. But we focused on the march through, the route of the march through Quebec into Canada, and the Valcour Island part of, of the story, and then separate trips to places like Philadelphia, so that was two weeks. And there are, there's actually a book, if you're really interested, I'd be happy to email you some of the titles that we found. There was something called, what was it, Marching in Their Footsteps? Uh, I'm telling you, there are people way more obsessed than I am, even. And that you could go, so it's like a tourist book, that you can find little inns along the way and also little out of, out of the way places. They stayed here, they camped here. These really interesting out of the way places along the way. So there's one over here, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Did you say why he did it? Yeah, I'm sorry. The why he did it is really a huge, again, it's, it's debatable, but I can give you some of the reasons that I think were very much in play. First of all, he was the kind of guy who never felt appreciated. He had been passed over for promotion, partly because he made enemies with people in power very easily, and also partly because promotions were made by Congress. It was done for political reasons. You know, rep I want someone from my state. No, I want someone from my state. It was exactly as it is today. But he didn't appreciate that. He just felt like, oh, they don't appreciate me enough. So there was that. There was seeing other people get credit for things he thought he deserved credit for. He was desperate for money. Um, he was eventually, he made such, such bitter enemies with the, the state government in Philadelphia that they brought charges against him for illegal trading and doing, doing other shady deals in Philadelphia when he was the military governor there, and he just felt so besieged by these charges. He had, in his mind, given his health to the revolution. He, he spent a lot of his own money. He, he'd become, he was very rich before the war as a merchant, and it was now basically broke because he fed the soldiers with his own money. And he just felt like he'd given everything to the war and gotten nothing in return. And, and I think that that those are some of them, but I think that's also really interesting to speculate about which of those was the most important, what role did Peggy play in it. She came from a loyalist family and was politically very much on the British side. Did he ever say why he did it? No. No, he said why he did it. He said he did it to, to save to save us. He said it, it was a positive good. He wasn't doing it to betray the Americans. He was doing it to save the Americans because the revolution had achieved what it needed to achieve, and if we kept going, we would just become this weak little nation, probably taken over. We had allied ourselves with the French. Come on, would you rather be allied with the British or the French? That was his take on it. And that's what Arnold does when he rides around. He says, you guys are fools. You're allying yourself with this Catholic French nation. They're going to destroy everything that we're fighting for. And he has a great time just haranguing Americans about what a terrible mistake they've made, allying themselves with the wrong power in Europe. But I don't, I don't know how much you can really buy into that explanation. What did the, uh, oh, I'm going to go right here for a step. This one? Yeah, because she was, I can't watch What exactly quote. did General Gates do to, to surpass um, Benedict Arnold in gaining the recognition that he got from Washington? Well, he, yeah, what was the question is, what did Gates do to surpass Arnold? He was a higher ranking general. He had more seniority. So he was technically in charge, in command at Saratoga. So when they won, when you win and you're in command, even though he just basically played it very safe and sat back in the fort, whereas Arnold went out and did the fighting, since Gates was in command, he, he got the medal. That's how it works. in the boots, really, he didn't expect that to happen. And that was one of the, uh, the moving forces when, he, when they captured him. Oh, the paper in the boots, yes. That was something that backfired that he didn't expect. Had it succeeded, he would have been interrupted. Oh, John Andre, definitely, yeah. That plan should have worked. 
It's a pretty good plan. He just made a few terrible mistakes, especially taking the papers. That was just the fatal flaw of the plan. Yeah. How old was he at this point? That's a great question. How old was he? He was a young guy. He was, when the war started, he was in his early 30s. So he was in his 30s throughout the whole story. And Washington was in his early 40s. We think of him as being an older guy, but they, most of these main characters were young. Young what did he apprentice to? That's my second question. Well, what did, what was oh yeah, the, who did he apprentice to? It was a local apothecary. So he learned the druggist trade, making different powders and, and things. But it was also, it sounded like the, the kind of store was basically like a CVS today almost. They had all different kinds of products, not just these crazy medicines, but they brought in books and all kinds of imported cloths and things, just a little bit of everything. And he learned that business and was very successful at that. That was a whole part of his life that we didn't even get into when he lived in New Haven. And we could have been, had a whole different life, you know, but the war came along and it was just the right time for him to, to jump in and make his name, because he was always trying to do that, always make his name. Yeah? It's interesting how the, uh, the Battle Monument near Skylar Hill uh, has these four niches and the four, right. four sides to honor these four significant people, General Philip Schuyler, Daniel Morgan, I believe, General Gates, and Benedict Arnold, with, uh, with each, each niche, except that of Benedict Arnold having a, uh, having a, uh, a statuary piece to... Yeah. Tough in middle school. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Where did he learn to sail? He grew up, where did he learn to sail? He grew up in a port town. His father was a merchant. And so he grew up sailing on, on boats with his dad. They would go on, on sailing trips to the Caribbean. And it just came very naturally to him. And so once he finished his apprentice, he was 21. And his old boss gave him a little money to get started. And he, that's when he moved to New Haven. And he, he got his own business together. And as a, in his 20s, he would sail very often up to Canada and down to the Caribbean to pick up lumber and other supplies, sugar and things, and, and bring them back to his, to his store. And so he was a very expert sailor by the time the war started, which became an important factor. Yeah. Just along with that, I don't know if I should confess this or not, but one of my ancestors was in business with him, ah. in the merchant shipping business in New London, I guess it was it. Yeah, New London was on the, on the Long Island Sound, yeah, right down the river from Norwich. Yeah. And I'm, there isn't very much information about that time period between the French Indian War and the Revolutionary War about what they actually did. That's really interesting. Have you heard the story? They need to that? do more research on that. Yeah, yeah. an ancestor tree. Arnold was, he was a really early patriot and tax protester, which is really where the whole revolution came out of, because he was a merchant and the taxes were very dangerous economically to him and his business. And there was a famous scene early in his life, 18, going way back to 1765, when one of his, one of the crew members on one of his ships informed the British tax collectors that he had been smuggling. Everybody smuggled in those days. The American merchants did. And this was a cardinal sin. You just did not do this. And Arnold famously when he was woken in the middle of the night and told that this guy not only informed on him but was still in town. And Arnold was in his 20s at the time, but he was the same guy he would be later on. He got up, he found the guy in a tavern, physically dragged him through the streets, tied him to a post, and whipped him in the middle of town. And the town elders were kind of horrified. This is vigilantism. He, was ended, he ended up being tried and fined, found guilty and fined. But it also kind of made him a hero, too, because to the, to the merchant, class in New England, and the sailors, they said, yeah, we're with this guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if your, your ancestor, uh, <laughs> if you have any family stories dating back to that period, it would be really interesting to hear that. Okay, great. Yeah. All right, we'll go all the way in the back, because we're seeing one in the back. Yeah. Like, 
Yeah, do they blame him? Do they blame him, in other words, for the fact that the plan, the West Point plan, fell apart? Yeah. I think, well, I don't know that they, yes, I would think the short answer, definitely. And they definitely, because he, it was his idea to communicate in writing, which was a big mistake. And so that's where the whole thing kind of fell apart. And what really made them resentful was, again, that Andre was caught. And Arnold then just showed up in New York City and said, okay, I'm ready for my 20,000 pounds now and to become a, a general in the British Army, which was the promise that he would become. So you can see how that wouldn't go over so well. He hadn't accomplished anything. I mean, the, the plan failed. Not only did it fail, but then this popular young officer was going to be executed while he's strolling around Manhattan in, in his new red coat. So that, I mean, he was off to a terrible start right from the start. And again, there was this other element to it that's, that's a little more subtle, but you'd think that they would admire him for at least trying to help, right? But their, their reaction, I think, was different. They said, well, what kind of guy would do this to his country? Hmm. Yeah, he did it to help us, but tomorrow he could be betraying us because someone offers him money. So what kind of gentleman would ever do this sort of thing? So they really kind of hated him right from the start. Which he probably should have anticipated. He wasn't so smart psychologically in that way to be able to figure out what other people were feeling. Okay, yeah. yeah. Where the document that was found, where is it now? That's a great question. I've never seen it, have you? No. Nope. I don't know that it was saved. It was a pass written by, signed by General Arnold, and then uh, some notes about how to attack West Point. But as far as I know, I guess it must have been lost, right? I mean, you'd think that would be a really great document to have. I've seen some of the letters that they wrote and their code that they devised, but never, never those fateful documents. Yeah, right here. On the other Arnold's rather tumultuous relationship with Gates, was there any reaction on Arnold's behalf after the debacle at Camden and Gates's later failure? Yeah, I would love that. That's a really good question, Gates really had a terrible fall from grace later in the war, and he was kind of exposed for not being a, the skillful general that he claimed to have been, or was celebrated as a disastrous loss in the South. I would love to know that. He asked, what was Arnold's reaction to that? Wouldn't that be great? I've never seen any, that's one of those details you would love to have in a movie or a novel, that a nonfiction, wow, I'd just love to have that scene of, of Arnold finding out about that. Um, there's not much about it though. That's what's frustrating things sometimes about true stories where you're not allowed to make anything up. That should be a scene in the movie, right? <laughs> totally should. He, had, he was so deep in his own troubles by that point too that I couldn't fully appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. The whole force of history was uh, determined by these tiny events. Yes. Yeah, the whole, definitely true. The whole course of history is determined by these tiny events. That's often, that's so often true. It's so often little things to do with the weather or these, these small misunderstandings or mistakes. Absolutely. You see that so often in historical stories. Um, how long did it take after they captured John right before they realized that the Arnold was part of it? Did they try to, like, to conceal it back so they could actually capture him? That's a really good, that's a really good point. How long? It all happened within hours. After they captured Andre, they realized that he was definitely a spy. And it looked bad for, for Arnold. But where Arnold got lucky was that someone brought back the news first to West Point that this guy named John Anderson, which was his code name, that was the name that Arnold had written a pass for this guy named John Anderson, um, had been captured by the Americans. So Arnold knew right away, he had minutes to get the hell out of there. And he jumped on a horse ran down to the Hudson River, jumped on a raft, and escaped that way. And, and Washington was literally at West Point when this happened, inspecting it. And he noticed right away that something was wrong. He said, these guys are not ready for an attack. There's something terribly wrong here. But he didn't suspect the cause. And then he came over to Arnold's house. This is a great showdown scene. You could, this is the flip side of what we just said. You could never make up something this good as a climax to a story. Is that 
that Arnold was supposed to host George Washington for breakfast that morning. No. And he's coming, so Washington rows across and marches into the Arnold's house. Peggy's there, but Arnold's gone. And someone comes in with this, the same notes, these same notes that we were just talking about. And, and Washington took them and read them. And people looked at him, and they saw his hands trembling as he read them, as he realized Arnold's betrayed me. That was how he put it, Arnold has betrayed me. But this was only hours after Arnold had jumped on this raft and gotten away. So they desperately tried to get him, and it was already too late. He was back in New York. And there's a really interesting part of the story is, is the Peggy angle, because was she involved? She was upstairs having some kind of hysterical fit. And to this day, this is another thing people debate about. I don't know, I'd like to hear your opinion. Was she putting on an act? Or was she really hysterical? She knew her, Benedict had come up very quickly saying, it's blown up, they found out, gotta go. <laughs> she had just had a baby, she can't go anywhere. So she was stuck in bed when Washington and his young aides, Alexander Hamilton was there, he was 18 years old, they come into the room and they see this hysterical woman and they couldn't figure out if she was putting on an act or not. But she convinced them that she wasn't. And I think that was partly just because of the chivalrous way men were supposed to treat women in those days. Oh, this young, beautiful woman couldn't possibly be involved in this heinous crime. But whether it was real or an act, I suspect it was an act, though she had every reason to be very upset, obviously. She convinced them to let her go. She went back to her family in Philadelphia, but people in Philadelphia had wanted nothing to do with her. They wouldn't let her stay in the city. And she, had, she then rejoined Arnold in New York. What do you think, Rashi? Um, I agree with you 100%. She's oh, a good actress. An actress? Yeah. yeah, there's one sort of conversation from 20 years later where she kind of hinted at that, but it's one of those great little mysteries, great little details. But of course she was much smarter than the gentlemen of those days would have given her credit for. It's just kind of the way these guys were. But there's really, it's really a great scene though when these guys come in. And Washington was good at some things, but he was not the people person type. So he comes into this room and she's there. She was hysterical. She was wearing, accounts say she was wearing this translucent nightgown, basically. Mm -hmm. And he was really, yeah, he felt it was really kind of an awkward thing. He comes in there and he's like, oh, there, there, you know. <laughs> he didn't know what to say in that kind of situation. So she really could, really, I think, really wrapped him around her finger. And the young officers were all in love with her, even before this, so she was well set up. Mm -hmm. Why do you think she yeah. stayed with him? Yeah, why did she stay with him? I, I, I think it's because she, I think they loved each other, you know? There's not, there's so, I tried so hard to research her, and there's a little bit on her early life in Philadelphia, not much, because nobody bothered to write the story of a, a teenage woman in, at that time, um, and there's just not so much known about her, but they stayed together, and it must have been miserable, <laughs> much of it, much of that time. Yeah, I'll take one more back here. Um, how was he able to find? How was he able to get away? Oh, I see. Yeah, they rushed. How was Arnold able to find out? It all happened, like I say, in a matter of hours. The timeline is really short on this, but because. When, when this guy, John Anderson, was captured, nobody knew he was a British officer yet. And the messenger brought the news to West Point, to Arnold's house at West Point. If Washington had been there, he would have found out at the same time. But he was over inspecting the works outside. And so Arnold saw the note first and realized the importance of it, what it meant, and, and was able to escape just as Washington was kind of rowing his boat. Guys were rowing Washington across the river, so it happened. Boom, boom, really, really quickly in a really dramatic way. And uh, people later were really angry at the messenger for showing it to Arnold. It's like, why did you? It's obvious that he was guilty based on these notes. You should never have shown it out. I don't know. He's my commanding officer. I was supposed to show him the note. And, uh, but that was one of those little things. He would have been caught. Certainly would have been caught. And you know what would have happened to him then? Yeah, it wouldn't have been good. <laughs> but thank you. This has thank been you. really a great.
thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I think we still have some um, refreshments on the bar, and we hope to see you again soon.